Now we move on to the ones that I'm least confident about. Uh, 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 yeah. Which are two for the legs with the point down, to be carried to both sides with the knuckles, uh, sorry, with the knuckles turned down, and then in brief instructions he mentions with the nails up. What is that? I have to collect my collect my buckler because it's too easy to run away. So stay. Bad buckler. So what is this guard? Or what are these two guards specifically? Um I don't know. I am of the opinion that you're gonna hear me out here, that they are similar to Porta de Ferro Lager and Tutu Porta de Ferro. Now we know that Tutu Porta de Ferro comes from uh, Fjord, or that's where I drew this from, okay? And Porta de Ferro Lager comes from uh, later or Bolognese sort of sources. However, the way Silva describes the defense in brief instructions in the sword and da dagger section, okay, when you were attacked to your legs, and if we add in, say, Joseph Swetnam, who actually encourages you to slip your lead leg, and he specifically says to pluck it up to remove it from danger every time uh, you go to defend or your opponent attacks, which is pretty cool. You know, that's a very early reference to the slip. Um, what Silver says is that when you defend your right side, you use the false edge from left to right, okay, so boom, a false edge cut, and when you defend your left side, because this can work on either both sides of one leg, or depending on which side, which leg is forward, uh, you go true edge to the left, okay, boom. So the motion we're looking at for protecting your legs is nails up, knuckles down, and you're going to have to excuse the angle here, okay, and if I grab my buckler, nails up, knuckles down, and you're basically doing this, okay, super duper Italian, all right, really, really Italian, and that's why I specifically chose Porta de Ferro Lager and Tutta de Porta de Ferro to, to essentially give a shorthand for how they function. Now, <laughs> Silver hated Italians. Oh, he didn't hate Italians, he hated what they taught it. At least so we think. So we're not, we can't use an Italian name for this because he'd be rolling in his grave. Alright, that's, that's terrible. That'd be like a slap in the face. So we need to find something that functions in a similar way but has a good, honest English name. And who are we going to go to? We're going to go to Joseph Swetnam and McBain. Okay, even though McBain is Scottish. So, you know, there's a whole issue there, but we ignore that. Porta de Ferro Lager becomes Joseph Swetnam's careless or lazy guard. Okay? Because Joseph Swetnam says that in the careless or lazy guard, all right, when you have your dagger, all right, as high as your cheek, although we're not going to put the buckler there, but just as, as an example, you let this hilt rest on your thigh, Okay, and your point should be somewhere over here. Now, he's specifically doing it so that it can come up into a thrust. Alright? Because he's teaching rapier, isn't he? But, we know for a fact that a false edge cut upwards, it cuts into open fight. Hmm. Alright, you can also false edge cut into a sort of forehand outside guard. Functionally, it works. We can also, and this is the most important bit, from over here, do an almighty bang to this side, carry it all the way up into open fight, drop it back down, or alternatively, boom, false edge and simply roll it around and jack it back in. So, lazy guard, because it seems to work. McBain teaches us about the Spanish and Portuguese contra, rapier and dagger. What he says, with the Spanish or Portuguese guard, which I've dubbed it, even though he doesn't give it a name, is they hold their daggers out here at about cheek level, cheek or eyebrow, sorry, at eyebrow level, um, and that they have their weapon down their side like this, down on the right side, outside of the right side of their body, a 
okay, with the point within an inch of the ground. All right, so something like something like that. And what does this immediately lead to? You know, I can do a big false edge cut this way. Fantastic. Okay, I can do a false edge cut that way. Okay, I can of course also do a cut this way and then roll it around to underarm. So you'll have to excuse me, I've, I've modified it slightly. So instead of having it with knuckles up, you simply turn it around so that you have this kind of position, right? It looks very Italian, doesn't it? And it follows the same rules that Silver just said. Boom. It's as simple as that, okay? Bang, I'm protected. Boom, I'm protected. Boom, 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 boom. And that's it. Okay, you just smack like this. If I hit this way, I roll into Bastard Gardens. Okay, then of course I can come forward like that. If I'm on this side like that, I can beat it all the way up into open fight, or I can beat and subsequently stab. So it's functionally similar to the Italian stuff, um, but we don't want to call it an Italian name because that'll make Silver cry. We don't want to make Silver cry, uh, and so we're going to dub it Portuguese Guard. Okay. So, in a very long, long-winded way, the two guards for the legs with the point down to be carried to both sides with the knuckles down and nails up, okay, are Lazy Guard, Porta de Ferro Larga, and of course Portuguese Guard, Tuta Porta de Ferro. So the last part of this eight ward system, let's do a bit of promo stuff right there, there we go, is that in, is that in shot, can you see that? Uh, not, not that I'm encouraging you to buy it. You should buy them. Um, the last two wards are and two with the buckler or the dagger for the head. And at this point, I got nothing. I have nothing. I have nothing. I have absolutely nothing. We know that with the single sword, okay, because when you fight with a sword and buckler or a sword and dagger, you should, as a rule of thumb, fight as though you were fighting with a single sword. Okay, until either A, the enemy lies spent, so they're actually already in an outstretched position, in which case you can engage and attack them, or B, you're so close to them that you can defend yourself double, okay, with two weapons at once. For extra security, but really, you're basically doing all this stuff, and McBain, of course, also tells us that, which is part of the rationale behind why I believe outside guard is the position, um, or a position, I should say, rather, because subsequently I can do all of this in front of the buckler pretty easily. Which, of course, brings me to one of the guards for the head, because McBain, as said earlier, Miller, although he's specifically speaking about the dagger, so what we have here is a guard for the head, all right, but it is very context sensitive, Matt Easton level context, okay. It is not a position you just wait in. If you want to wait in a position that protects your head, go up into hanging guard, okay? Go up into open fight, you know, go up into any of the high line guards. Those protect your head and obey the rules. Defend yourself with your sword, not necessarily with your offhand weapon. You know, give or take a bit. So, I think that one of the guards for the head, and this is the weakest argument I can think of, is only related to the situation in which it is used, which is, as they said, even though one mentions a dagger, and in fact Swetnam mentions this as well, if it's a very weak cut from a light weapon, so a, a rapier, okay, or um, which is not a weak weapon, I, I shouldn't say that, but it's a less powerful cut, all right, from something like a walloon or a spadroon or a small sword, early small sword, or a rapier, okay, or something like that, it's most likely a rapier, a Spanish style rapier, which McBain would have been speaking about. Okay, uh, you can parry single. Okay, they all they all say this. Even Silver says this. Funnily enough, he doesn't. He, he tries to sort of play it down a bit, but 
he basically says the same thing. If it's a really weak cut from a quite a light weapon, you can just you can just don't even have to move. You just put it in the way, and it's a waste of their time. Okay. However, when you specifically attack someone, okay, legs, you put your hand, shield up to protect your head, and you can subsequently attack their legs. All right. Page says. Again, he's specifically talking about the Taj, okay, but there is some interrelation between the two. So that's that's it. That's 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 my argument. It's it's rubbish, but that's all I can really think of. One of the guards to protect your head that is specifically with your dagger or with your buckler is only done either in a static sense, okay? Context. Right? Either done in a static sense, you don't need to move it at all, because it's already there. Or alternatively, it is only done when you are going to attack a low line and subsequently you need to cover yourself. Which brings us to the final ward with English Sword and Buckler with, the, with a ward, because there are two wards to protect the head with the dagger or buckler. With the dagger or buckler. And at this point I've totally run out of steam and I just think it's warding double. That's it. I got nothing. I got absolutely nothing. I can't back this up with anything other than what Silver says. Um, basically the difference simply being for this particular head ward is I can protect myself like this from a hanging guard or maybe a sort of true guard position. I can come into a sort of outside guard. I can be in open fight. I can come up uh, back under into a sort of a bastard guard, okay, kind of variant. But if I'm in the standard outside position, okay, and I want to protect my head and I'm holding it up sort of if we're quite late, so McBain, I'm holding it out actually quite far in front of me and quite high, or if we're a bit earlier, probably a little bit lower, all right? But essentially, if I want to protect my head, all I do is I parry like this. That's it. Exact same way that they tell you to do with the dagger. I just parry like that, okay? Parry like that, parry like that. It's not technically a guard with the buckler specifically. Rather, it is a guard double, okay, in combination with your sword, all right? And that's, that's weak. I know it's totally weak, but that's all I got. Okay, if I can protect myself, if there are two guards for the head with the weapon, so two with the point down, the head's covered. Okay, it's completely covered. If I had to say, with this particular weapon, all it would be, okay, is maybe from this position and just doing that. Okay, because we know, and again, like you just read, we know that the buckler is usually kept behind the sword. Okay, so it's that I can do everything I want in front of the sword. And subsequently this backs it up so I can actually withstand pretty powerful cuts, just like in Sword and Dagger. However, if we take the other tactical approach, say Miller and uh, Miller and Swetnam, even though Swetnam speaks specifically about a dagger, doesn't touch on buckler, Miller just tells us that you use the buckler like a dagger, funny, funny that. You put your buckler in front of it, so you're actually reinforcing your buckler, okay? At this point, it's kind of hard to get around. I'm sort of limited to either doing this sort of stuff, which takes time, or what I think is most likely Miller's case, and which is what uh, Swetnam says, is that I'm dealing with quite light weapons that are used with the wrist, okay? And of course, then we have McGregor, who So McGregor is obviously telling us that basically people who are really quick with this were the ones who survived the longest. And because of that, if I need to do that, I can just, you know, I can just do whatever I sort of do what I really need to do. I don't really like that approach. Personally, I definitely prefer having the buckler backing it up so I can, you know, do all the shit I need to do, you know, come into an outside guard, swing up into a hanging or maybe a true gun, might come from here, you know, sort of cut down into this position, false edge up back into this position. 
Again, like I said, this is a working theory. Take what you will. I want to hear what you have to say as well. So if you have something pretty cool to say, feel free to leave a comment down below as well. That would be greatly appreciated. In summary, I appreciate you watching this far as well. Thank you very much. I know it's been a long one uh, without a lot of fun stuff in it, but that's we're working on it thus far. If, if what I'm saying here is, you know, true or at least valid, um, with the stuff that I've been practicing and with the people I've been practicing with, it's a really, really solid system. Like, you know, pretty tough to break through. Um, so, just to finish up, those are the justifications for the positions that I've chosen, the eight wards of English, sword and buckler. What are they again? Just to recap, the positions are, extend your buckler out in front of your body. You can of course hold it like you should a dagger, so you should put your thumb on the back of the grip if you don't want to do that and you want to secure it more. You can put your thumb, if you can reach the flat of your blade, you can put it just off to the side or just into a nut. If you can't do that, then you simply twist your wrist slightly, just a natural twist, okay? So rather than doing this, you twist it like that, okay? And if you can't do that, you simply move your thumb up to the side and that kind of stops, that reduces the thrust to the inside. Safely, as far forward as you can without it actually inhibiting your weapon, all right? That is to say, I should be able to get my weapon uh, through it. You'll have to excuse the chicken wing floating elbow because I'm sitting so I can't really rotate which way I want my body to go. Of course, start an open fight, all right? Just as though, and this is very uh, Vijani, very Vijani sort of thing. So you might start with your stuff in a scabbard, punch out into open fight, leave that point trailing a little bit if that's your style, okay? And then you're going to step forward which, with whichever leg you prefer and cut down, okay? And let it roll around into Bastard Gardens, okay? Then you're going to step forward again, cut out into forehand ward, and then slowly try to put it into an outside guard, okay? Then you're going to step forward again, and you're going to switch into a hanging guard, okay? All true gardened, all right? And then you're simply going to parry, you know, assuming they try to attack your buckler arm, you've got it covered, okay? And then you're going to swing it right back up into open fight, okay? Those are the first four primary wards. The second wards are, of course, maybe you're up here, all right, which is lazy guard. So I cut all the way down into this position. Okay, so into bastard guard, but then I roll my wrist around, very German, very priest special long point, okay. Here, and then I bat the stuff off the side, all right, drop it down into Portuguese guard. And if I get attacked on the other side, I simply bat that aside, all right can trans, transverse. Roll it round into Bastard Garden and then cut back round. If you're more of a German person, you can of course just use a false edge. And the last two guards, uh, which are with this for the head, which are, if it's only a weak cut, okay, just parry single with your buckler, just do whatever, it's only a wrist cut, all right? If it's a bit more substantial, parry with your buckler and your sword together to protect your head, okay? And if you are attacking the legs, okay, or a low line target, cover your head as you step in. So there you go. So open, bastard, outside, true guard, okay? Lazy guard, Portuguese guard, okay? Head guard, and double to either side. So thank you everyone for watching the video, I appreciate it. Um, hopefully I'll have some videos coming out soon with me actually sparring with this stuff. It's just I've got to kind of figure out a few mechanics of it. Again, yeah, appreciate you guys' support and all the comments you leave. It's always great. I'm always learning something. There's always something to learn subsequently. Uh, and if you want to know more or you want me to do more uh, series on theory and stuff like that, let me know, okay? And uh, I'll try to make it happen. But until next time, thanks for watching and uh, have a good one.
Ugh. Quick thing I forgot to mention as well. Um, because of the length of a standard backsword or broadsword, so we're talking about anywhere from 90 to 100 or so centimetres, okay, and given the average size of surviving Welsh bucklers or bucklers that were manufactured in England, which are not insignificant, okay, we're looking at 35 upwards of 40 centimetres, okay, you don't need to lean forward, okay. In fact, it is probably better that you don't lean forward, okay. So if you're trying to work off what we've just discussed, um, stand bolt upright, okay, like Silver and Swetnam and a whole bunch of other English sources say, okay, you're allowed to lean forward a little bit when you're delivering the cut, okay, time of the hand, time of the hand and body, okay, but only a little bit. You don't have to stay in the sort of, you know, you know, senpai noticed me free access to that sort of zone area forward position. All right? Cool.